ahead and press okay. the record button. Debbie, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sorry, I just stepped off. No. Hi, everyone. My name is Debbie Harris, and I'm a senior recruiter here at GitLab. Today, we have with us Nadia Vatalides, Igor Grunvig and Macintosh, and Rose Tacken to talk about country conversions and international expansion. So, GitLab has team members all around the world in more than 65 countries. And within people group and recruitment teams, we often get the question, but how do you employ all these team members while also complying with local rules and regulations? So that's why we decided to record an interview and share some of those frequently asked questions with you. So first I'll kick us off with questions which are related to recruitment and onboarding. And thereafter, Ruth, uh, Rose will take it over for team member specific considerations. So let's get started. Nadia and Igor will be explaining some of the answers to our questions. So Nadia, that is certainly a lot of countries that we can hire in. Can you tell me in what main forms GitLab hires team members across the world? Yes, yeah, sure, Debbie. Um, basically, we have a bunch of different models. GitLab's got a few entities ac across the globe. And in those entities, we're able to hire um, employees. Um, in other locations, we use professional employer orgs. Um, and we have a bunch of those vendors and depending on the location, we would then go in and find a, an employment scalable solution through a professional employer org, um, similar to locations like Russia, Ukraine, um, even in South Africa, we have a PEO and a few other locations across the globe. We also, um, as an as a early stage model um, and when we were a startup, we hired contractors. These are not traditional contractors and, and how the rest of the world would view them. These, these are through one of our Dutch entities under, um, under our GitLab ITBB entity. And usually what we aim to do is convert those, those contractors to employees or under an employ, employment scalable solution in the very near future. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, From and time, Igor, um, Debbie, is, I can also... I just want to add, from time to time, we also have vendor consultants, which aren't true contractors. This is an agreement through a vendor. And this is usually for very short-term um, needs and not something we do on a very regular basis at GitLab. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and Igor, why does GitLab convert countries to professional employer organizations or entities? Um, well, to start with, um, if a certain country hits... Um, a threshold of five people that are uh, individual contractors. That's usually our um, starting point to look at a certain country where we say, well, um, we have a certain workforce. We are apparently scaling in that, com in that country. So we need to basically um, get a scalable employment solution in. And that's usually where we go to a PEO, reach out to them, ask for a quote and start considering uh, what we can offer our uh, employees. Um, and it's also to mitigate risk uh, in terms of tax risk and employment risk, to be honest. Um, and that's the PEO part. Um, when do we convert from PEO into entity? So um, there are two decisions that are generally made. Either we um, set up an entity or incorporate uh, an entity due to the fact that the business requires it. So let's say in South Korea and Japan, that was really requested by sales organization um, because it's an interesting market for GitLab to be in. Although we didn't have employees there, we just you know, went ahead and set up an entity. Um, the other one is for instance, right now in Ireland where we have more than 30 um, people covered by a PEO and having a PEO that costs um, quite a lot of uh, money for GitLab and it basically is a cost benefit analysis where we say uh, what does it cost to have a PO in place and what does it cost to manage your own entity and um, yeah basically if you're with more than 25 people in a certain country it, it's, it's more beneficial in terms of cost uh, uh, efficiency to set up uh, uh, your own entity in that country. Great, thank you. That's really interesting. So um, if there are countries where GitLab indicates they can't hire, 
either how likely is it that it will change in the future? Where could I, as a candidate, monitor that change? Um, for some countries, we really cannot hire. Um, if you talk about Crimea or uh, Syria or those countries that are basically excluded from a US uh, perspective, um, some countries we tend to pause uh, where we hit that, that threshold of five or more people where we have uh, individual contractors in. So one example, current example is Singapore where we paused, uh, South Korea we paused until we have a uh, scalable employment solution in place. Um, so it does change in the future for some countries, but it really depends on which geographical location we're talking about. Because I, what I'm thinking like uh, countries like Crimea, we will never be able to, uh, to hire. Um, and for instance, in terms of um, countries like Singapore or uh, um, maybe France, maybe not, not a real great example, but um, um, I, I see a change there coming. So, um, and where we, um, where you can monitor that change, we have a website uh, of GitLab, it's, it's found in the handbook. Um, I think it's a country hiring guidelines page where you can check which countries are non-hiring countries and uh, you can always reach out to the uh, to the GitLab team on, and we have an issue, country conversions issue, where you can go to and ask questions. That's great. Thanks, Ivo. Um, so why do we have two different compensation factors? So for example, 1.0 and 1.17. Nadia, could you take us through that? Sure. So we have actually documented this in our compensation section of the handbook as well, if anyone wants to go to refer to that. But ultimately, in locations where we have not yet set up an employment scalable solution, we offer an additional 0.17, so 17% opportunity to assist with additional costs. And whether that's benefits, payroll or accounting costs in setting up a company to invoice GitLab, if that's a requirement in your location, or if that is... Um, if there's additional expenses to run a company in, in general. The 1.0 is for em employment costs, where, um, oh, sorry, for, for the employment factor, which basically means that the person is, is working for us full time. We potentially have benefits linked to that, and that's why we, we offer two different percentages. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. That's great. Thanks very much. So, so then what happens, Nadia, to the 17% contract factor um, once uh, the country's converted, but was it originally included in my compensation? That's a great question. Sorry, I just closed some doors having kids at home. Um, basically, um, we, we, we do a full analysis on every single country before we just make decisions based on we, whether we're going straight to an employment factor or not. And one of those decisions is based on the benefits in a country. In some locations, the state benefits are exceptionally high and awesome and great, but in third world countries or other countries across the world, benefits are necessary. And so we've got to see what we can replace that 17% and what's viable. Keep in mind, we also incur quite a large cost by hiring through a PEO. So addition to that 17%, we do take in consideration, as I mentioned earlier, payroll costs. Um, and for that reason, we then analyze, you know, what percentage are we going to drop the person's compensation or the country's compensation by? Um, and that can vary, again, depending on the country, depending on the benefits, depending on the um, on the, the analysis, the benefits, um, as well as the people special, sorry, the total rewards and the people specialist team then conducts. Okay, okay, that's really good. Um, I suppose another question that comes up, if I'm part of the sales team um, and I receive a, a variable bonus as part of my comp, would um, a country conversion impact that? Would it say affect my OTE split? From my understanding, it won't impact the actual percentage of the split. There could be an impact on the base salary, depending on the country we're converting in, depending on the benefits we're offering, but it won't impact the actual split. So for instance, if it's a 70-30 or a 50-50 split, it should not impact the percentage of the split. Does that help answer that question for sales? Yeah, cool. Or variable pay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, we can see what a great job um, the team is doing with the many country conversions, and there are a lot on the list, and, and the entity creation tracking issue that you, know, you can see on the website. So I, I realize it varies according to the country, but how long does the process take, and briefly what is involved? Um, well, th thanks for uh, uh, stating that we are doing a great job um, to start with. Um, so how long does a process take? In general, it takes, uh, for instance, payroll, it takes payroll three months to, uh, from the kickoff of a country until uh, payroll go live date. Um, and we tend to, and it's, it's really, it really depends per country, but I think a three month window is something we, we can um, bear in mind when uh, talking about one country conversion. But uh, for instance, you need to get wet signatures for if you want to incorporate a con uh, um, an entity and um, getting wet signatures is quite a challenge at GitLab, especially now um, during COVID. But um, I think three months is, uh, is, is more or less um, the, um, yeah, the term. And what is involved in terms of stakeholders I already mentioned payroll, but we have, of course, people ops, payroll, we have tax, we have legal, we have finance, we have controlling external stakeholders like uh, payroll uh, consultants, we have uh, tax uh, consultants, we have legal consultants, um, and last but not least, we have um, basically uh, third parties supporting us setting up the, uh, the corporation in that specific uh, country if it concerns uh, the incorporation of an entity. So there's... Um, a lot, yeah, a lot of stakeholder management uh, taking uh, place uh, if it uh, comes down to country conversions. Wow, yes, it certainly is. And it's very complex by the sound of it. Lots of things to think about, lots of hmm. balls to juggle in the air, um, and especially at the moment. So, I guess, how do you prioritize or decide which countries go next then? Um, well, we just had a had a fantastic exercise as far as I'm concerned. I think it's fantastic. Uh, what we did is drafted a decision matrix where we um, combined certain factors and marked certain countries as, as red, orange, and green. So green are the countries where we don't need to prioritize yet. Orange, um, basically the, the risk is, is, is higher uh, in terms of exposure for GitLab and the employees. And red is of course, uh, uh, we need to take action, action right away. So, um, and that really helps us in making a decision uh, where we say, okay, this country needs a conversion, this country needs an entity, and these countries, we just put this aside until uh, we have more time to, to focus on those. But also currently as a team deciding if we can share this um, on an issue to the entire GitLab. I don't think this will be externally shared because there's compensation data on there. There's not per team member data, but there is country specific like overall comp data. And I think we will seek approval to see if we can share that with the entire GitLab because it's uh, it's a really awesome risk matrix to, as Igor mentioned. And this was Igor's idea and the people specialists along with the data, data team was able to implement it. But it would certainly give great insight insight into why are we converting it's why did we convert India before Philippines or whatever the case may be if that makes sense yeah yeah that's great that's really good information thank you thank you both so I'm going to hand over to Rose now who will take us through some of the FAQs we see from current team members Rose Yes, thank you, uh, Debbie, and also thank you, uh, Nadia and Igor, for this has been super informative for me uh, as well. Um, so as uh, Debbie mentioned, I'm going to take you to some of the frequently asked questions by team members, right? Because like team members are impacted and there are so many stakeholders internal to GitLab. Um, so I do, I do have some questions. Some were already answered. Uh, so I'm just going to go through and, and, and see. Uh, uh, what else, uh, what, uh, what, what more information I can get from you. Um, so I think there already has been a great um, explanation about like why we convert certain, um, uh, certain countries, right? Um, but when these convert, like when we have decided we're now going to convert this country, what is approximately like the timeline or when are team members involved or informed about this decision? Um, Right away, to be honest, I think that that's. Uh, I have to um, give thanks to uh, to the people ops organization. So Nadia and her team, they, they did a great job in uh, 
basically in the past when I joined it was a year ago it feels like ages but um, th there wasn't really a clear communication towards the team that was in fact uh, affected by uh, by this country conversion and right now it's just like okay decision is made we are going to convert that country and basically within 24 hours either Ross or Helen or whoever was uh, uh, taking control of that country um, sends an email um, starts an issue copies every uh, every manager involved I think that's 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 a fantastic way of basically getting yeah getting everybody involved from uh, from day one and when we get the um, basically when we get the quotes from the PEOs then uh, we have an AMA session with the team that is uh, uh, affected uh, to, to gather their feedback to be honest and that, that also helps us in uh, efficient decision making and uh, and of course uh, GitLab is all about feedback, so we need to, uh, yeah, have the team involved that's uh, currently, uh, yeah, not having sleepless nights, but I, I can understand that they, yeah, it, it can be overwhelming uh, being appointed uh, as a second next country to, uh, to be converted in. Yeah, exactly. And it's really great that um, uh, that we have the communication flow going, but also that team members really have the opportunity to give feedback, right? I saw a lot of issues where we're converting that team members, team members can give feedback there. Um, and, and this is maybe a bit of a uh, an answered question already, but if, I, if a country converts, like which team members are impacted, generally uh, speaking? Yeah, all the, all the people in that country. That's one thing, and their managers. Um, of course, they are family <laughs> as well, but um, just, I, I'm not mentioning a certain location, but sometimes people have uh, situations where you really feel uh, sorry for their situation, and you're just, you know, it's not like you're, you're bringing bad news, but in some countries, they're heavily impacted in terms of their, their net income position. And, uh, um, it, it doesn't keep me up at night. It, I can still sleep, but uh, those are the, the not not the most fun conversations uh, to be in. So, uh, um, yeah, does it answer your question? Igor, I could I actually want to add. Like, I think joining joining GitLab as any team member, what's super important to note is if we hire you as a GitLab IT BV contractor, or if we have. In the future, we will convert you. And I think coming into the environment with that in mind will definitely take away the feeling of being vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. Ultimately, like one, we want to be on the right side of the labor law and we cannot mm -hmm. continue hiring people on a contracting basis in a lot of countries across the world and, and not, you know, and legally ensure that we're compliant. So if we think about things like IPO or just being on the right side of, of labor law in, in 68 different or 65 different countries, um, that is something to keep in mind once you're hired. And so I think if, yeah, moving forward, we've also indicated to the recruiting team, we've also updated the handbook to make it very clear that if you are selected as an ITBV contractor at GitLab, we will convert you. And we have an OKR in place as well to convert every single country in the world. And we're working hard and fast to, to reach those locations. So as empathetic as we are, it is, a, it is something that we have to do to ensure that we're on the right side of the law long term. Yeah, that makes total um, total sense. And of course, it's um, some some situations are um, difficult or complex. And I also hear the whole process is pretty complex. So I, I can imagine this is um, well, this is a big chunk of work for for everybody involved. Um, and then maybe a bit more on the compensation side, right? We also get like compensation questions um, with the conversion. Already a great explanation of the 17%. Um, but if I look at um, uh, when we are converting or in general, like are compensation benchmarks, for example, re-evaluated uh, for specific countries? It depends on so many different factors. So if we're converting in, in times like February every year or March or April, that's very close to an evaluation that's just taken place during the comp review, the annual comp review. So chances are very low of having an additional evaluation. If it happens later during the year, that would really be based on feedback from team members. Even if one team member shares that there seems to be misalignment, the total rewards team will go above and beyond to make sure that the um, location factors are accurate and that 
you know, either we need a reevaluation or not. Um, it also, it, it's really based on the feedback that we receive from team members. So it's important that we get that feedback from the start, that if there's any concerns that they feel that they're being unfairly paid or that it's under the, the, the location factor of what it should be, then a re-evaluation will take place. And that has happened for locations, but in other locations, a, a evaluation just happened due to compa reviews. So I think it's quite situational and depending on the time of the year. Yeah, indeed, that makes sense. Good, um, then um, I think also with converting, it could happen that your pay frequency changes, right? I think we have different types of pay frequencies, but also with conversion, like how do we see that often that the pay frequency changes or is that always a standard thing or like how, how does that work? Ultimately, our GitLab IT BV contractors invoices GitLab monthly. And so in most cases, your pay will remain monthly. But if there's a mandatory requirement in the country to change that, then we will have to comply to the mandatory compliance in that location. And it also depends on the PEO. So depending on, you know, on their advice to us to say the standard for X location is you know, 12 months or bi-weekly or whatever the case might be. We also need to be compliant of that. And um, the payroll team will look into information like that and do an analysis and, and see how that aligns with their best practices. If it's an entity, we will use local council, um, GitLab's local council to make those decisions as well and to get like mandatory requirements versus like perhaps just a, a suggestion. So we can't take suggestions for those things. We need to ensure that we're compliant based on what's the standard for that location. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Good. And I think earlier Igor mentioned uh, that um, your team, I think Natalia loops in um, and managers too. Like if I'm a manager and somebody in my team is converting or there's a con country conversion happening for somebody in my team, like what can I do or what should I do? I think we're trying to create awareness by communicating that. The manager needs to keep in mind that this is a business requirement and we would really like managers to, um, to, to get on board with conver conversions on a larger scale. Um, if there's any concerns or questions they have or a misunderstanding about why we're converting a country, I'd highly recommend that they reach out to us immediately. They can either reply on that thread to the person that sent the email directly or they can reach out to any of the people's specialist team or really anyone in international expansion, which includes Total Rewards, Igor over here, myself, the entire people's specialist team, um, or even payroll. So if they have very specific concerns or questions, they can um, reach out to us directly with that. But I think one thing to keep in mind for all managers is that all countries where they have someone in the team that isn't a GitLab ITBV contractor will convert at some point. Um, so that's important to keep in mind, even during hiring, um, and to not, perhaps not overcommit that they can remain a contractor, because that's not something we can offer at this time. Does that help answer? Is there anything else you have in mind, managers? I, for me, no. Maybe Igor, I don't know. <laughs> Nothing to add. No. Huh? Awesome. Good, I think we're entering my last question and this might be a bit of a difficult one because sometimes on ITBV contractors, we offer the opportunity to not be paid in local currency, right? If people convert um, to, for example, GitLab entity, is it still possible to, to be paid in another currency than the local currency? Um. Yeah, it's, it, it's really, it's, it's a, uh... Simple question, but uh, it's a difficult answer. Um, basically, if you have an entity, um, it is subject to local uh, regulations. And, um, and if you want to basically uh, basically report revenue or report any kind of things in, in US dollar, you have to uh, apply for approval for that. And uh, it's it's uh, we need to get a US dollar bank account. We need to take into account you, the fact that we have to uh, um, keep US dollar reserves. And that costs a lot of money, um, to be honest. So um, it's not that GitLab can't pay in USD currency, but it's just uh, a choice across the board. If you have an entity, you have to think locally 
And if, because these entities generate revenue, they get cash in, in local currency, and there's cash. If you want to pay out a US dollar, you need to convert that cash into US dollar. That costs money. You need to, and there's an FX uh, result uh, in that. And uh, overall, um, it, it's, it's a cost decision not to do it um, because it costs GitLab too much to keep those reserves. I uh, Riz, I want to add for our PEOs, 95% will tell us that you cannot pay in another currency than local. And the reason for that is it's a local company that is paying those team members. And so that's also then a mandatory requirement to pay in local currency. We have the exception of three or four locations currently with GitLab that are hired through a PEO as contractors. And that was due to the fact that in those locations, so I'll use one example, Poland, it's socially acceptable to be a contractor. And, and we went that route to both from the feedback from the, the team members in the location, but also the feedback from local council, including our PEO. And in those instances, we were able to offer a fluctuated, like uh, different currencies or a different way of paying, um, but that's hard and, and far to find. And again, it's it's really dependent on the country plus the way those those folks were hired. Um, so the, usually there's like a five percent exception, but if um, if it's if it's a local company, it's really hard to do that. If even if it's not a GitLab entity but a PEO. I see. I see. Thanks for uh, thanks for providing that information. I think I'm going to hand it over back to uh, to Debbie. Yeah. Thank you. That was really good. Very interesting. Um, and thanks for all anyone out there joining the call. Um, anyone who needs more information, we encourage you to go to our website, um, gitlab.com, and our handbook, which has loads of other information. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>